Hello. So, the last few installments of Legend of Galactic Heroes, we've done the full on-camera recap thing, or rather the, the voiceover with Bills from the Show recap, but there, there was narrative stuff that happened in the last book, but when it comes to broad strokes recap, it's a lot smaller when covering what happened last. So, I'm going to stick with doing this vlog style. Stick some images up on the screen, but this is going to be a vlog style recap. So, previously on Legend of the Galactic Heroes, Yang Wenli, his officer corps, and various remnants, considerable remnants, of the Free Planets Alliance fleet have withdrawn to Isolone Fortress, which Yang Wenli has retaken again. That makes him having taken the fort successfully twice, and the Emperor Empire having only actually taken the fort once after it was abandoned by Yang Wen Li and had no defenders. So there is that. And so the military garrison of Isolan Fortress has, as part of their taking over the fortress, has also formed an alliance with the planetary system of Alpha Sil with LFSL becoming, a, or re retaining rather, its democratic status with Isolone as its military protectors. Meanwhile, Emperor Reinhardt von Lohengrom has been itching for a rematch. He's been wanting another fight with Yang since he lost the last one. And he's not satisfied the fact that his, that it really was a loss. He won, technically, but it's like winning on points. He's like... Uh, Apollo Creed in uh, Rocky II, where, yes, he beat Rocky Balboa, technically, but he's not happy with how he won. And he wants that rematch. Finally, while all this is going on, the Church of Terra is still hanging around, still plotting, still waiting for their chance, and they're still seeking their goal of restoring Earth to prominence and doing so in a manner which keeps forces of democracy and the force of the Empire clashing against each other. They want one side annihilated and the other side broken. The Church of Terra can move in, take advantage of the weakness of whoever wins. But they really, really don't care who that is. So, we begin with Book 8. This is where we are at the start of the book. And this book really feels like a conclusive finale to the feud of Reinhardt von Lohengrab and Yang Wen Li. By which I mean, like, coming into this book, I'm like, this has to be the last fight between these guys. We can't have them keep doing it. It's not in with their character. Yang Wen Li is not a guy who goes seeking a fight. When the Free Planets Alliance fell, he accepted retirement gladly. He's not going to bend the knee to Reinhardt von Lohengrim, not the slightest. But on the other hand, he's not going to push for a fight because he's not a fighter. He's a historian. It's been this defining character trait since the beginning of the series. Because he's a guy who, when all has said and done, doesn't want to fight wars. He's good at it. He's possibly the best in the galaxy at it. But that's his curse. He wants to retire to his books. He wants to stay home. He doesn't want to have all the be the cause of all this death. But he is anyway. Reinhard von Lohengram has demonstrated a tremendous sense of will over the course of the series. He is directed, passionate, he is very strong-willed, but he's, he is the iron fist in the velvet glove, uh, politically. He doesn't want to become the next um, Emperor Rudolph. Emperor Rudolph, the, the first emperor. He doesn't want to take the Empire back to what it was before power. Quite the opposite. He, he is a reformer. 
with the catch being achieve his goals because he's driven to do this by Anne Rose and by by the late Siegfried Kirkheis. In order to do this, he wants he needs to unite the galaxy. He wants to end the cycle of war. And then he can reconstruct the systems of government to fit something which he feels will work and end all the abuses that led to his sister being effectively sold in the marriage in marriage with the Emperor. Always the thank thankfully to both of them a chaste marriage but a marriage nonetheless. So, there's that, but Reinhardt isn't, doesn't have his heart in the bureaucracy side of things. He doesn't have the heart in the internal politics and the actual running of government. He's still a warrior at heart, but he's a very smart and intelligent fighter. He's a very smart and intelligent strategist and tactician much like Yang Wen Li. It's why they are such strong rivals. They have well-thought-out, well-conceived political philosophies. And they are also both very good when it comes to waging war. Yang doesn't want to do it. Reinhardt doesn't care if he wants to do it or not. He knows he needs to do it to achieve his goal. Reinhardt is a pragmatist, Yang is a kind of an idealist. And that's their conflict. And just having them fight over and over and over again, big, bloody battles with hundreds and thousands of people dying, weakens both their characters. Yang Wenli is the kind of guy who's like, who looks at the ranks of the dead and goes, <clears throat> if he's beat, goes, all right, I'm licked, I'm done. I'm going to retire and walk away from this rather than continuing the violence and bloodshed. <clears throat> it comes up in this book that, Rhino, that Yang is the kind of guy who doesn't want to be a cause celebre, who doesn't want the level of hero worship that the founders of the Alliance had. That's not how he is. Reinhardt, having him stubbornly, bloody-mindedly ramming his head against the brick, or punching his fist against the brick wall of Iserlon Fortress, after it's clear that he can't take it, weakens him as a character, because it turns him from a clever, cunning, devious tactician Someone who doesn't know when he's lost. And that is an important and significant thing for a character. The best strategists know when they're beat. And that's kind of the case here. And also, this is, again, this leads to our political philosophy. Because Reinhardt, Reinhardt is a dictator. He's a dictator who's attempting to reform a dictatorship while keeping it a dictatorship. And he's doing this also without putting a little thought, I mean, he puts a little thought into lots of things, but he doesn't think, and this is called, called out in the book, what happens after him. He's Alexander had a picked heir. Alexander the Great had a picked heir. He had a son. Um, who he expected to succeed him. He expected the son to be older when but he still expected him to be succeeded by his son. Whereas Reinhard von Lohengram he doesn't really care. Like he's a little like Imperial Rome. Rome, when it comes to this, where you'd have an emperor adopt somebody into their family, and that person would be their heir, and how they'd pick their successors to be the Roman emperor, up to a point. And that 
is not something at this point in the series, at least, that Reinhardt's really thought about. And we kind of see in this book, to a certain degree, how much, or rather how little passion he has for the actual job of governing. His heart's in winning the war. It's not necessarily what you do after the war. Whereas I think Yang goes the other way. Yang is someone who can't wait for the war to be over. And to a certain extent, his strategic line, a tactical line of thinking, is with that in mind. But that's the kind of issue there. It's like, he's like, okay, I want to preserve the torch of democracy. What can I do to do that? I'll fight to do it. But I don't want to have to keep to constantly to do it. So the way you do it is you win really hardcore. And that's going to lead to the big battle of the book. And then afterwards, we get the diplomatic side of things. And this actually leads to the problem. With it. The series as a whole kind of has a very dry tone to it. It's had that since, like, book. Some books manage this more than others, but there's always a certain not quite like a reference book, but it kind of comes up. You'll have the book occasionally calling back to, or calling attention to or referencing the writings of historians who will come later in the setting, looking back on the events. And that's a really, like, when that comes up, Whatever richness the book has kind of dries up a bit. Not bad, but it's very... Bland isn't the, right, the word I'd use, because it's, it's, it's very much an acquired taste for how you do a, a science fiction, military science fiction. Oh. And in this book, we get a major character death. I'm not going to say who. Because we're, you know, this book is still fairly recently out as of this video recording, the next book hasn't come out. This book has a major character to death. And the gravitas of that death ends up being undermined by this dry tongue. You get a sense of the impact of what this character's death has on the people around this character, their friends, their loved ones, that sort of thing. But by putting this reflections of these various historians on this character and this death and this event. It gives the book a sense of remove and distance from the events that we lose our immersion in this. We, we feel less of the moment. We are less in the moment and more looking at it clinically. And when it comes to a major character death, don't want to view that clinically. You want to embrace the emotional response. Boromir's death in The Lord of the Rings is a moment where, when it happens, you want to feel emotionally compelled and drawn into the moment. You want to feel... Boromir's despair at the hobbits being taken. He wants to feel Aragorn mourning for his, what is ultimately his countryman, his fellow, his fellow man of Gondor. Um, the son of the steward. You want to feel the loss of life. You also want to feel at the heroic deed that Boromir accomplished to, um, before the hobbits were taken. And the the sense of what it took to bring him down. You don't want to hear you want to hear the bard saying, if, if you're going to have a, a distant or third-party perspective as opposed to from the view of someone witnessing it, you want a bard singing a song about it. You don't, if you're going to take that tone, you don't want the narrative equivalent of you want the book to like do the equivalent of a guy from the History Channel cutting in 
and sitting in a chair like my, like mine in a study somewhere talking about oh this death it was a catastrophic blow to just a so and so and it really changed the course of the conflict by having it for death it 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 caused like they didn't do it this bad when it happened to Kirkheis and Kirkheis's death completely like caused a mental gear shift for Reinhardt von Lohengrop. Um, doing it for this character harder ruins the scene tremendously. That said, this book wraps up with the status quo that is in a very interesting place. And that keeps me in that's enough to keep me interested in the book going into book nine. I don't know how much further this can keep going from here. Because we're at a point where the Iserlone Republic woefully outmatched by the Empire. They're in a really defensible position. But having, again, Book 9b, and then Reinhardt von Lohengram starts throwing his troops against Isolon again. That doesn't give, do me any... That does nothing for me. Um, and the Alliance Isolon Republic is not in a position to go on the offensive. They have Isolon Fortress. They kind of got Alpha Sill. Uh, I say kind of because your ships are all based out of Isolon Fortress. Alpha Sil is not in range of Thor's hammer, which is Alpha Sil's big doomsday death ray super laser thing. So, I mean, you're limited in how you can project force to protect Alpha Sil, particularly since the capital of the Empire has moved away, has has moved to um, Azan. So they can do an end run around to it any time. It's actually why Yang picked this picked Iserlon in the first place for his new capital, for the, for the home of his uh, self-save democracy. Because Iserlon is now of absolutely no strategic importance whatsoever. So it gives less incentive for Reinhardt to keep pushing against it. You still have a Church of Terror to deal. And Book 9 could certainly involve them. But if it's still, if it's the continuation of Ice Alone versus the Empire, I'm not going to stick around much longer. I'm, I'm, I'm running... I, I'm, I'm losing... My taste for this. Not that I don't like military science fiction. It's not like I'm not going to watch the anime. But we're at a point now where... To make a culinary analogy. We're on your fifth day of pepper... Of uh, combo pizza. Of, or supreme pizza. Of pepperoni, salami, and Italian sausage green peppers and that sort of thing. It's a great pizza. It's got, got meat, cheese, veggies, all the good stuff. I love it. But you have it too often in a row, you get sick of it. You're starting to get sick of this. Of this particular clash. Give me a different type of clash. Give me a different conflict. I liked a lot earlier in the series, when we had characters both from the F both from the Alliance and from the Empire heading to Earth to root out the Church of Terra. I like that side of things. I like the conspiracy stuff with the Church of Terra and Fizan from earlier in the series. And if we shift and if we go, okay, we're shifting gears now 
the Church of Terra as primary antagonist. I dig it. We'll see where we actually go from there going forward. As always, links to where you can get this book will be in the show notes um, through Bright Stuff and Amazon. Buying anything through those links helps to support the site. Again, the eight books we've gotten thus far, I have enjoyed. And I'm going to move on to book nine when it comes out. And that book will basically decide if I keep going with Legend of Galactic Heroes from there, or if I go, maybe this was the place to stop. We shall see. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 